as Buddhism declines in India, and I do need to say we're not entirely sure of why this occurs, we do suspect that it is a result of Muslims arriving in the north and uh, destroying some of the monasteries and also some of probably some of the uh, the teaching centers and libraries that belong to Buddhists as well, causing the Buddhists to migrate, moving uh, first to Nepal, uh, then to regions we would call today as Tibet and into China. And from China, I like this map because you can see coming out of India, Nepal, Tibet, China, we can go over to Korea and ultimately to uh, Japan. So China <clears throat> becomes a kind of conduit uh, for carrying Buddhism to other major countries or locations within the world. Uh, for right now, however, I want to focus a little bit on Tibet, uh, which is uh, f basically adjacent to India, shares the Himalayas essentially, and it will be here that um, Buddhism is going to take hold in a very important way. It's going to become even more mystical. It's going to kind of blend with a native uh, religion of Ban, and it is going to take on uh, a quality of mysticism that is not inherent in uh, Buddhism outside of this area. But because it is mountainous, there are going to be a number of separated monastic uh, communities, very decentralized within this region. And as a result of that, we need local leaders. These local leaders are referred to as lamas. Uh, they uh, are individuals who help to teach and uh, preach the message of Buddhism. And Basically, the bottom line is that we can, following this path in a single lifetime through effort, uh, arrive at enlightenment and therefore release. Art is going to play a major role in Tibetan Buddhism, and that is going to include depictions of bodhisattvas because it is the greater vehicle that does settle into Tibet. These are tankas. Uh, they are paintings on cloth, and that would generally be cotton or silk. Uh, the one that is in O'Reilly is 316, and it is located on the left. I have two additional ones, a bodhisattva located right here, and then over top right is an image of Buddha. Uh, all three of these being tankas, uh, cloth paintings, and then I have an image of someone who is actually working on one, uh, creating a, a tanka today. So this is a tradition also that is uh, continuous, and these images are being made today, as we will shortly see. So why paint on cloth? Uh, well, uh, these are unframed, and they can be rolled up easily for travel. Remember, this is mountainous, and the monasteries are separated, so you can have a cloth painting uh, done in one monastery. You can roll it up. You can carry it with you. You can take it from place to place. Uh, you can use it as a teaching tool, and you can also use it as a source for meditation. In other words, you can present the image, and it can be uh, an image that you use as contemplation when you're in the process of meditating. Uh, these uh, tankas tend to follow a pattern. There's usually a central, uh, most important figure surrounded by other figures. Uh, again, it is the essence of the individual, not a portrait. Uh, it is very hierarchic, very formal, very frontal, uh, and very, very symmetrical. The one that's on the left is a bodhisattva, not the same bodhisattva we have been focusing on, which would be the bodhisattva of compassion. This is the bodhisattva of insight or of wisdom. This bodhisattva appears with attendants, and the main figure of the bodhisattva right here is located inside a temple. That temple actually also functions as a kind of throne, and at the base what we have are the petals of lotus flower, which again is a reference to purity and the possibility of perfection.
The attendants are located in two smaller temples. So if we go up here, we can see an outline essentially that encases and protects the attendants. Uh, all of these figures have a kind of flowing quality, a curving quality to their body. And I think that can be traced to sources in India, Indian, and basically in Indian art. Tibetan Buddhism in its art generally favors formal compositions. And if we look in particular at the Bodhisattva located right here, uh, or the Buddha, which is in the upper right, I think it's very, very easy to see that. Um, O'Reilly has characterized this as a desire for, quote, order, balance, and harmony of the cosmos. So it becomes relatively easy to pick these up and identify them as Tibetan. The colors also tend to be a giveaway, a lot of red and a lot of gold. And the reason for that is that these were displayed inside monasteries where the lighting was very dim. The lighting in fact was produced with f flickering lamps, which we'll see in a, in a moment, which tend to enhance the mystical qualities of these tangas. Just to let you know that this art is alive and well today, I recently located this on the web for uh, $189.60, which by the way, folks, is a 20% discount. You can go to Nepal Tanga Art and acquire a recently made tanga uh, painting on cloth. Uh, both of these images are tangas and they are both of the medicine Buddha, a very, very popular Buddha, and it's the idea that his teachings will cure us. Now, that can be teachings that are uh, spiritual to help uh, to perfect us so that we can attain release, but many people actually go to the Medicine Buddha for physical healing as well, so providing for a sense of security and comfort uh, for practitioners. This is a view inside one of the Tibetan monasteries. And I would like you to see, in fact, the interior of this is red, uh, the love of uh, gold and red and the way in which, and these are burning candles right here. And I'll show you one in a second in detail, but the flickering light of these candles, uh, which I believe are butter uh, candles, uh, flicker in the dim light and accent the very rich reds and the glittering spiritual qualities of the gold. Uh, the painting that is in this monastery is of one of the lamas, one of the uh, local rulers and would be associated in particular with this monastery. Behind the picture of him, and I'm sorry, this is my photo, uh, and I didn't account for needing this picture. This is another Tanga, and I think you can see one figure here, one figure here. The central figure would be located directly in the middle on axis with great formality, and it would be in this environment that the Tanga would be uh, viewed. Uh, this is a closer look at one of those candles. It's really a butter lamp with a number of wicks uh, flickering and creating very mystical and mysterious light within an otherwise dimmed interior. This kind of lighting does help you to relax for meditation. It tends to clarify your thoughts and the butter itself is often offered as a gift to the monastery in helps uh, of supporting the monastery by pilgrims who might come and visit here. This is the most famous of the monasteries in Tibet. It is the Patala and it is located in Lhasa, which is considered considered to be the capital region of Tibet, now, now under uh, control of China. Uh, it is 317 in our textbook. And it previously was the home of the Dalai Lama, uh, the Lama who was basically above all of the other uh, rulers, local rulers or Lamas. Uh, it is a hilltop monastery and it's a really a rather amazing structure. Uh, buildings were constructed one on top of the other, essentially kind of being built into the uh, earlier foundations so that the growth itself of the buildings does seem organic 
organic. Uh, it has a quality of growing out as if it were a mountain. And I think the reason for that, it is that it is modeled on the mythical Mount Patala. It's not a real mountain, it's a mythic one. Uh, it is there, it is believed that the Bodhisattva of compassion lives. And this would be the most important of the Bodhisattvas in Tibet. And in Tibet, that individual is referred to as Avalokiteshvara. Um, and this is the same Bodhisattva of compassion we saw in India, different name, same one we'll see in China, known as Guanyin. Just another view, um, really suggesting mountain peaks and growth coming out of the earth and a very, very solid base. This is uh, very sacred to the folks in Tibet. And what we're looking at here is someone who is uh, making a pilgrimage to the Patala by doing prostrations. So all the way around the mountain, monastery this individual is getting down on hands and knees prostrating himself in an act of pilgrimage these are prayer flags uh, that are hung in the landscape essentially along the mountain base when you travel in Tibet, you'll find prayer flags uh, hung in uh, large numbers throughout the mountainous uh, landscape itself, uh, giving a display of color, but also a display of movement. Uh, these flags are representations not of prayers for an individual, uh, but for all of us, uh, basically uh, uh, displaying uh, the hopes for happiness and, and health and wealth for every sentient being. Uh, they are intended to be temporary. Uh, and a closer look at some of the prayer flags over in the left slide. I think most of you have seen these. Uh, they are temporary because uh, within Buddhism, uh, everything is considered to be changing constantly and uh, permanence is an illusion. Buddhism remains uh, very important uh, within Tibet today. And as you uh, drive also through the landscape, you're going to see uh, sometimes on the roofs of houses, incense burners like the slide that I have located on the right. Uh, these function very much like the prayer flags do as offerings, but more as uh, hopes for the good will for all of us, for good things to happen uh, to all of us. And as prayers that arise to the Buddha or to the Bodhisattvas in the uh, region of Tibet, where, of course, Buddhism is a greater vehicle. The most famous Bodhisattva in Tibet is Avalokiteshvara. And you will often see images of this Bodhisattva with multiple heads and multiple arms. And the idea is that with these heads, the Bodhisattva can see us and see our needs. And with these arms, the Bodhisattva can reach out to actually help us. Another Tibetan Bodhisattva of compassion or Avalokiteshvara, uh, this one's said to have a thousand arms. I'm not quite sure there are a thousand there, but there are many. And each of them has a mudra, uh, enough to make you crazy, I think. Uh, one of them, at least we can recognize, is this one, which is the mudra of meditation. The multiple arms to help us, the multiple heads and eyes to see our plights and our needs. Needs. This, of course, is the Dalai Lama, and most of you perhaps recognize his image because he's a kind of world famous figure. Uh, he, by Tibetans, is believed to be the reincarnation of the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara, and consequently, he is considered the leader of Tibetan Buddhism today. Due to political shifts and changes, however, the Dalai Lama is currently in exile in India. 
all of this serves as a good introduction to the spread of Buddhism outside of India, where it will largely be Mahayana moving to the east, which I think we can see right here, all this great big block of orange. Although there are areas of Theravada which remain, and we can see this here, and also this is Sri Lanka, where we originally looked at the image that shows us the death of Buddha.